OK, this is the fourth and final response to Gettier's challenge to <clears throat> the definition of knowledge as a justified true belief. What we're going to look at here is going to build on the various responses that we've looked at to Gettier's challenge. So just as a quick recap, we want to know what his objection was to JTB as the definition of propositional knowledge. And remember, this involved the three conditions, according to Gettier, not being sufficient for knowledge because we need to be able to rule out luck, which he's arguing justified true belief does not. So we then looked at some different kinds of responses, those which were characterized as internalist responses and those which were characterized as externalist responses. And you want to be familiar with why infallibilism and no false lemmas, the first two responses we looked at to Gettier were internalist approaches and how reliabilism, the third approach, is different in this way. Then we looked at one big problem <clears throat> for reliabilism called the generality problem. This is an important objection because it's also going to come up for some of the other approaches as well. So this fourth response then is called virtue epistemology. And this is going to build on the sort of approach that we've seen in Aristotle's ethics, um, where he talked about the notion of virtue there, but it's combining it with the notion of knowledge and epistemology here. So the first thing that we want to get clear on then is what, what we mean by an intellectual virtue as opposed to an ethical virtue here. So a virtue, generally speaking, is an excellence of some kind, either innate or acquired, uh, a disposition, a skill or a competence that makes us good at achieving some goal. So for Aristotle, this was uh, for achieving eudaimonia, of course, this was for achieving flourishing. Um, in this context, it's about something different. So one analogy which is used by the virtue epistemologist Ernest Sosa is that between um, knowing and archery. So consider the difference here between a lucky shot and a skillful one in archery. The skillful one hits the target as it's the product of a well-trained archer. And this is someone who mostly hits the target. It's not infallible. Um, if there is a hurricane or the target is too far away, he won't hit it. So the skill applies only to the right kinds of conditions. But an intellectual virtue then is similar. It's one which mostly attains the truth and avoids error. So the way that Sosa puts it, he says, let, let us define an intellectual virtue or faculty as a competence in virtue of which one would mostly attain true belief and avoid error in a certain field of propositions F when in conditions C. So what sort of things would count then as intellectual virtues? Well, there's different ways of approaching this and we'll look at Sosa's approach first and then a different approach afterwards. So for Sosa, the kind of things that reliably get us to the truth, uh, intellectual virtues on that model of what an intellectual virtue is, would be things like, generally speaking, sight, reliable kind of good memory uh, and sound reasoning. These would be things that are instances of generally getting us to the, the right answer for things that we want to know. So Sosa, to introduce a distinction that might be useful here, is what's called a virtue reliabilist sometimes. So what does this mean? So his idea of intellectual virtues focuses on reliable cognitive processes. So things like sight, as I've just said, memory and reasoning. Um, because of this, because of this focus on things which are reliable processes, he's sometimes known as a virtue reliabilist. So one advantage of this uh, is that it accommodates the sort of animal knowledge that we looked at with reliabilism, where animals can be said to know certain things without necessarily being aware of their reasons for knowing. In other words, without this internal justification that they can kind of reflect on and think about themselves. So Sosa allows for such reasons uh, however, under what he calls reflective knowing, as opposed to the animal knowing. Uh, and reflective knowing is justified in the sense of having reasons that we can reflect on which justify our beliefs. But this would not apply, for instance, to very young children or to animals. So the reflective knowing accommodates the sort of more um, internalist aspect of our knowledge, whereas the um, animal knowledge accommodates the more straightforwardly kind of externalist examples we looked at with reliabilism. <clears throat> 
So in contrast to the virtue reliabilists, you have something also in virtue epistemology called virtue responsibilists. Now the emphasis here is on a slightly different thing. So as well as the virtue reliabilists like Sosa, you have virtue responsibilists like Linda Zagzebski, who we looked at earlier in the topic, who are going to emphasize those characteristics which we are responsible for cultivating as intellectual virtues. So in contrast to the reliabilists who looked at things which we're not particularly responsible for cultivating, but are reliable cognitive processes like sight and memory. Um, the emphasis here is on things which you do and practice to get better at knowing. Uh, and this is a slightly different approach, uh, which focuses on what we're responsible for. So think of some examples. There's a couple on the slide here. What kind of characteristics can you come up with regarding how these people or others you could think of form their beliefs? How might they cultivate or perhaps not cultivate if we're thinking of intellectual vices, uh, the sort of things that might get you to the truth or perhaps lead you away from the truth? What sort of thing, in other words, would count as intellectual virtues here and what would count as vices? So for people like Zagzebski, the sort of thing that uh, virtue responsibilists would focus on in, in intellectual virtues would be things like being perhaps reflective as opposed to being dogmatic. Uh, if you're dogmatic, you focus very much on one view and you're not being persuaded out of it. You kind of stick to your view, whatever anyone else says to you. Whereas if you're reflective, you're more likely to consider objections to your view and modify it and perhaps even reject it if you think that it's wrong. Whereas someone who's very dogmatic often won't look at the kind of other alternative views. You might be fair minded as opposed to being prejudiced. This is a similar kind of quality and perhaps you might cultivate the idea of looking at alternatives and not going into a situation prejudging the outcome. You might also be intellectually courageous rather than sheepish or conformist just because everyone else says a particular thing. That doesn't necessarily mean for you that that's the correct thing to believe. You might look at alternatives or people perhaps who are brave and standing up to the um, status quo when perhaps it needs to be challenged. And you might also be rigorous as opposed to being slapdash. So actually investigating your sources, checking up on things that you're not sure about, perhaps confirming it across a number of different sources, uh, as opposed to just believing the first thing that you read. These are all qualities that you would take some responsibility for cultivating. They're not things that you automatically have. They're things that you have to cultivate and practice uh, to become more intellectually responsible. So let's drill down a little bit more uh, in how this deals with Gettier then. So virtue epistemology has these two different kinds of approaches. I'm going to focus mostly on Sosa here and what's called his triple A rating. So we've mentioned this comparison that Sosa gives with archery and knowledge. Uh, what we need to focus on here is how this is going to help us get around the kind of Gettier examples like the stopped clock or Smith and Jones. So how does this deal with Gettier cases then precisely? Well, this is our new definition of knowledge, which is a true belief formed virtuously. So this is going to get around Gettier cases by replacing the justification that we looked at with previous definitions with the idea of intellectual virtue. So this is supposed to be more useful, perhaps more precise or more specific than the, the mere idea of justification, which as we saw, lets this gap occur where we have these lucky cases of justified true belief that Gettier plays on. So Sosa is going to use this idea of a triple A rating. This is just a way of remembering the three things that he says uh, beliefs have to be in order to be knowledge. So that the three things are they have to be accurate, which is his kind of term for truth here. They have to be adroit, by which he means they are formed virtuously. This is the, the kind of central focus on arriving at the truth through this kind of virtuous uh, cognitive process that we looked at beforehand. And then finally, and this is really, really important, they have to be apt. 
In other words, they have to be true because of the uh, virtue which is used here. In other words, there has to be this link between the truth and the way that you arrive at it. And this really is the novel and important part of what he's talking about here. So this is going to try and deal with Gettier cases because they are not apt. They are not true because formed reliably or with virtue. They're just coincidentally true. So if you think of the stopped clock or something along these lines, these all involve elements of coincidence. They're not properly dealing, according to Sosa, with the link between the truth and the way that you arrive at it. So for the stopped clock, you coincidentally looked at the stopped clock at the correct time. You didn't look at it and arrive at the truth through your virtuous processes. You arrived at the truth by this fluke of it having been stopped at the time that you looked at it. So the coincidence generated the true belief here. It wasn't a direct result of intellectual virtue. So this is the kind of picture that Sosa is getting at. So you have the archer, to go back to this kind of analogy, um, what we want is we want to hit the target. So that's the accuracy. So we want to get to the truth. That's the kind of analogy there. Um, it, it needs to be fired skillfully. So the archer has to have the kind of skill, in other words, the intellectual virtues that we're looking at when it comes to knowledge. And then you have to hit the target because of the skill that's used. So this is the apt nature of the shot here. So you get to the truth because of your virtue. So to think of a kind of case where this might go wrong, so to think of a case along the lines of Gettier, you might think about a skillful footballer who could score a free kick by chance. And how would this be like a Gettier case. So think about this as an example. Could a skillful footballer score a free kick by chance? How could this happen? And how would this be similar to a Gettier example? And which of Sosa's three A's would be missing here? Okay, so how does this stand up then, this kind of new virtue epistemology approach as a way of dealing with the kind of Gettier approaches uh, and examples we've looked at so far? Well, <clears throat> one problem, as we saw with some of the other uh, approaches, is the fake barn scenarios. So remember in this case, Barney arrived at his true belief through a virtuous process if we count something like sight, as Sosa does, as intellectually virtuous. So remember, Barney is driving through fake barn county. There are all these fake barns along the side of the road, and he just happens to look up at the end of the road and see the real barn. He believes on that basis that there is a real barn at the end of the road, but actually it was unlikely that he would have seen or noticed a real barn given that he was driving through a whole county of fake barns. So the belief that there was a barn where Barney saw it would seem to be apt. It was true and that truth was arrived at virtuously, in other words, through the reliable cognitive process of sight. But because of the context of fake barn county, it was still luck so according to the original example, that's not genuine knowledge. So perhaps intellectual virtue does not successfully deal with all cases of lucky truth and fails to properly define knowledge. So how might we deal with this from a virtue epistemology standpoint? Well, perhaps Sosa could say that Barney has a kind of knowledge here. So go back to his distinction between animal knowledge and reflective knowledge. Perhaps Barney has a kind of knowledge which is the unreflective or animal knowledge. He doesn't reflect on the scenario or form any particular beliefs about the process by which he arrived at the truth, but he did nonetheless arrive at the truth by a reliable method. So therefore, he does have knowledge that there is a barn, but only animal knowledge rather than full reflective knowledge in the sense that Sosa talks about here. This might raise wider problems about how we're pinning down the notion of intellectual virtue here. 
if you wanted to explore this more, you might think about how the generality problem could apply to what we're talking about with intellectual virtue here. Could this notion of intellectual virtue perhaps be too vague or too general to actually give us proper instances of knowledge or not? So we've looked at the four responses now then to Gettier's challenge to the justified true belief definition of knowledge. And this takes us back to the overall essay question here, is propositional knowledge best defined as a justified true belief? Remember the focus of these questions is evaluation. So good philosophical essays should be evaluating, weighing up whether the definitions offered here are any good or not. Uh, and one way to do that, which would be quite sophisticated here, would be to use Zagzebski's guidance on good philosophical definitions. So if you could incorporate some of these in your evaluation, you'll have a more persuasive answer. So, for instance, she says that successful definitions would, among other things, not be circular. It shouldn't kind of incorporate or assume the thing that it's trying to define. It shouldn't be ad hoc. It shouldn't be improvised in a way which just specifically adds something on to deal with a specific example. Rather, it should be kind of rigorous and universal. It shouldn't be obscure, it shouldn't be too far removed from common sense, it should have some sort of intuitive use and feel in how we use knowledge, ordinarily speaking. And it should crucially effectively be able to show how luck is not knowledge. This again is the central underlying intuition which, which runs through this whole topic. So epistemologists are trying to pin down a way of distinguishing knowledge from luck, trying to show that this uh, can be done in the way that Zagzewski sets out in her guidance on definitions. So if you can use any of these things in weighing up your uh, responses and try to show overall which one is the best, that's pretty much going to be the most sophisticated way of uh, approaching this question. As a way of recapping, just think back now to the four responses we've looked at to Gettier and perhaps just try and apply them quickly in your mind to one of the examples or you can write this down if it would help as well. So just as a recap, thinking about the central challenge here, what each of these responses from infallibilism to no false lemmas to reliabilism to virtue epistemology, each of them are different ways of responding to Gettier's challenge, which says that justified true belief is not sufficient to define knowledge. In other words, what we need is either something else as a condition, so this is what infallibilism and no false lemmas are trying to add on, or a, a different definition. So remember, reliabilism and virtue epistemology are both dropping the justification condition and trying to come up with something more specific and more rigorous when they're thinking about how to define knowledge. So a true belief plus a reliable process or a true belief formed virtuously in the case of the last example here. So have a think about this, try to perhaps jot something down and just recap and quiz yourself on how would each of these deal with the particular example that you want to go with so that the stopped clock is the standard example here. If you've had a think about these responses, then you might have come up with something along these lines. I'm just looking at the stopped clock example for now as a quick recap to see how each of the responses is trying to add on or amend something on the definition of knowledge here to try and avoid Gettier type examples. So that's the challenge here is to avoid those Gettier type examples counting as knowledge by adding in a condition or changing the definition somehow. So infallibilism says the stopped clock example isn't knowledge then because the belief is based on something fallible, something which could be mistaken or reasonably doubted. So in this case, the clock is broken. So that isn't knowledge uh, for that reason, according to infallibilism. No false lemmas, remember, does a similar kind of job here. It says the belief is based on a false assumption. There is a lemma or assumption or underlying belief that the clock is working. 
uh, and that's false in this case. So that's why the, the stopped clock example doesn't count as knowledge. Reliabilism, remember, wants to focus on reliable processes. And in this case, the belief they would say is not based on a reliable process because broken clocks are not a reliable guide to the truth. And then finally, if you're taking the SOSA triple A kind of rating as the virtue epistemology approach, we could say that the belief here is accurate. It's true that it's one o'clock or whatever the time is, um, that it's arrived at virtuously, that we're looking at clocks generally is a kind of good way to tell the time, but it's not, and this is the vital thing here, apt. It's not true because of the virtue. I don't get the right time because of my good intellectual habit, but due to chance. And that's the crucial way that virtue epistemology rules out the Gettier examples.